Good afternoon. Um, welcome to another uh, intellectually exciting event as part of our 150-year celebrations and activities. We are very pleased and honored, honored to be hosting our guest today, uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi, uh, a distinguished academic and intellectual who has had a significant influence on uh, our understanding of the Middle East. Uh, Professor Khalidi, as some of you very well know, is uh, currently the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University and the former director of the Middle East Institute at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. Um, he, has, uh, he received his BA from Yale in 1970, his doctorate from Oxford University in 1974, and since then he, he has uh, spent his time as an academic in the most prestigious institutions around the globe. Uh, from 1976 to 1983, he was a professor at American University in, um, Kai, uh, in uh, of Beirut between um, 76 and 83. As I mentioned, he then moved back to United States and uh, has been a professor at University of um, Chicago and also director of Center for Middle Eastern Studies as well as Center for International Studies. And then he moved to Columbia University where he is a professor right now as I have already mentioned. Uh, his work, uh, in his work he addressed uh, historical construction of uh, nationalism, emergence of uh, national and political identities in the modern history of the Middle East, and also uh, Western involvement and the role of the U.S. in the Middle East peace process. Uh, although he is a historian by training, uh, a look at his work shows clearly that his approach and studies cut across disciplines. Uh, again, as most of you uh, could very well know, he is a very productive uh, scholar with numerous journal articles as well as books. Uh, among his books, just to name a few, are Palestinian Identity, The Construction of Modern National Consciousness, The Iron Cage, The Story of the Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, Resurrecting Empire, Western Footprints and America's Perilous Path in the Middle East, um, Sowing Crisis, the Cold War and American Dominance in the Middle East, and most recently, uh, Brokers of Deceit, How the U.S. Has Undermined Peace in the Middle East. I might also mention that two of his books, Palestinian Identity and Resurrecting Empire, won the Middle Eastern Studies Association's uh, very prestigious Albert Hurani uh, Book Award uh, for those two books. He also served as the president of the Middle East Stud Studies Association of North America and is currently the editor of Journal of Palestine Studies. And if I'm not mistaken, which includes an interview with Ahmed Davutola, I believe the most recent uh, issue. Um, he is also uh, very active in sharing his knowledge and views uh, with the public at large. He has written op-ed pieces uh, for numerous uh, newspapers and shares his ideas on other media as well. Uh, he has also been involved in diplomacy at different levels. Um, so to conclude on behalf of Boaz University community, I would like to thank uh, Professor Khalid for taking the time to visit us and accepting to deliver this lecture as part of our 150th year activities. Uh, I also would like to remind you that this, uh, his talk will be uh, recorded and the podcast will be available soon on the 150th year website of the university. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Khalidi to the floor. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to be speaking on the 150th anniversary of uh, Boazeji, which uh, I was telling your rector, I think may well be the finest university in the Middle East. So it is a great honor to be here. Um, I, I uh, will accept any invitation to come to Istanbul. Um, there are very few cities that I will say that about. Um, but uh, it's a particular honor to be here on this, on this occasion. 
Um, and I, I hope that my talk, which is mainly historical in nature, is not overshadowed by the exciting events that are taking place uh, in Istanbul and elsewhere in Turkey uh, today. Um, some of them, in some ways, may relate to some of the things that I'm talking about. Uh, what I propose to do this afternoon is to offer a few historical observations on the obstacles to constitutionalism and democratic government in the Middle East. Um, I have the fortune or the misfortune to live in the United States. And if one is to judge by the way in which the topic of constitutions and democracy in the Middle East is dealt with in American public discourse, uh, they would make you think that any such discussion should be a very brief one. These people never had democracy, they don't know how to have democracy, and so on. Uh, even uh, those in the United States who are otherwise well informed appear to believe uh, that the Middle East never had any experience to speak of with democracy. Uh, and it, you often hear in the US media uh, claims that uh, the Middle East uh, provides and has always provided very unhospitable ground uh, for democracy because of what they describe as the peculiarly anti-democratic nature of Islamic society or the Islamic religion. Now, I I'm not really going to address these misconceptions uh, tonight, or this afternoon. Um, I, I, I will a little bit. I will also discuss some aspects of the history of constitutionalism in the region that stretches from the Atlantic coast of Morocco to the Caucasus and the borders of Afghanistan. Um, but before I do that, I want to make three broad observations to clarify what we mean when we talk about constitutions and democracy. And uh, I, I'll conclude by touching on what may be the prospects for uh, constitutions and democracy in the Middle East. Now, I'm a historian, so I will not predict the future. We, that's not part of our job description. We don't do that. Um, there may be other scholars who feel they can. We don't feel we can. But I hope that some of the things I'll say about the history of this may give you some pointers about the present and the future. The first of the three observations I want to make is the well-known point that one of the crucial steps in moving from any kind of autocratic system to a more democratic system is to establish limitations on the absolute power of the executive, the king, the sultan, the shah, the emir, whatever. In a highly evolved political system, this takes the form of a constitution, a rule of law, a system of what in the United States is called checks and balances, although there are other means uh, than that to achieve the same end of uh, restraining or limiting absolute executive power. We know from the history of states that have evolved towards constitutional systems that controlling the power of the executive is usually a lengthy and difficult process. Uh, it took the British the better part of two centuries, the 17th and the 18th, uh, to finally delimit the powers of the, of the king. Uh, so this is a long process in any state that has done it. Um, it's often hard for historians who are trying to talk to the present to, to incorporate or to project a sense of the halting evolutionary nature of this historical process into our understanding of the movement of actual political systems in the world today uh, in the direction of greater constitutionalism or greater democracy. Moreover, there is no guarantee that once the powers of the executive have been limited, as they were in the US by the Constitution at the end of the 18th century, and again in the 1970s in the wake of the Vietnam War, there's no guarantee once that's been done that efforts will not be made to re-aggrandize these powers now, I'm going to make a point that's particularly important for the Middle East, which is that this re-aggrandizement of the power of the executive after it's, they've been limited constitutionally uh, is particularly uh, reinforced in wartime. Uh, one of the wisest of American statesmen, James Madison, he was later on president, said, and I'm quoting Madison here, of all the, true, of all the enemies of true liberty, War is perhaps the most to be dreaded. In war, the discretionary power of the executive is extended. Its influence in dealing out offices, honors, and emoluments is multiplied. And all the means of seducing the mind, think of propaganda, all the means of seducing the mind 
are added to those of subduing the force of the people. No nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. War is in fact the true nurse of executive aggrandizement. That was Madison. Now I think these words are particularly applicable to the Middle East, which is a region which has been racked by war for much of its modern history. This country, under different state formations, the Ottoman and the Turkish Republic, uh, was at war from 1911 until 1923, continuously, without a break. Um, other Middle Eastern countries have been uh, at war on and off for a great deal of time. But these are also words uh, that people in the United States should keep in mind as they contemplate the prospect of what George Bush announced as a global war on terror, which the Bush administration told us was without end. This would, this would go on permanently. Um, I, I think it can be argued that that sense of special wartime dispensations to limit constitutional freedoms uh, has been carried on uh, in its essential elements by the Obama administration. They don't talk about a global war on terror, but in terms of espionage on the people and limitation of rights, they behave as if there was a permanent war. So that's the first point I want to make, general point, and it particularly applies to the Middle East. A second feature of the movement towards a democratic system is the development of an active public sphere and the evolution of mass politics, a vigorous press, and party political systems. A vigorous free press, not a vigorous owned press or party press or press under control of a, lim a limited number of, of oligarchs. Um, and we know, or we should know, that these are not necessarily entirely positive phenomena as anyone who watches American politics on the national or local level uh, with any attention uh, can attest. I, I gather that Turkish politics teaches some of the same lessons about some of these processes not being entirely salubrious. Uh, political theorists tend to look at aspects of democracy in abstraction. They provide us with categories which sound splendid in principle, but this encourages a tendency to idealize reality and to see the platonic forms of pure Athenian democracy instead of the messy, corrupt, and often egregiously unfair practice of actual de democracies operating in the real world. And I'm talking in particular about the United States. Uh, this in turn, in other words, they look at the United States and they think that what's in the Constitution is what we have. It's not really what we have in the United States. This uh, idealization makes people expect Jeffersonian democracy in other places, uh, whereas I would argue Americans probably have never had anything like the vision that Jefferson had in the 1790s. Um, I speak, I should say, parenthetically, from rich experience. Uh, I lived for many years in Beirut. Uh, I can tell you a great deal about how Lebanese democracy works, but I also lived for 16 years in what, one of the leading laboratories of corrupt one-party American democracy, Cook County and the great city of Chicago. During the time I was there, one-third of the members of the city council were not only indicted, they went to jail on charges of corruption. That is American democracy at its finest. Um, historians who look at real world situations in the past uh, sometimes avoid these pitfalls of excessive idealization, although the inclination that some of them have towards mindless empiricism means that they sometimes don't see the forest because they're so busy looking at specific trees. Uh, this means that public discourse is often starved of coherent and understandable accounts of how real democracies function in practice, the messy way in which they work. Um, I would argue this is true even in countries with long histories of constitutionalism like France. Uh, France had a revolution in 1789, um, and I think there are many possible answers to the question of how long it took after the revolution for France to arrive at a stable and lasting constitutional formula. Think of the monarchies of the 19th century. Think of the second, the third, the fourth republic. Uh, one answer, think of Vichy, a fascist interlude in French history. Uh, one possible answer to how long it took the French to arrive at a stable and lasting constitutional formula is 170 years from 1789 until the Fifth Republic was established in 1958. And that's a long-standing uh, 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 history of constitutionalism. So that's my second point. My final point, just of these introductory points, 
is that when we talk about the actual practice of democracy and constitutions, our analysis is almost always ahistorical. It assumes that the conditions we enjoy in the present uh, were always present in the past. Uh, for example, the American uh, Republic, which has the oldest written constitution extant, the oldest continuously used constitution, um, did not provide unimpeded access to voting, to the suffrage, and therefore was not in any way fully democratic for most of the citizenry, uh, notably women and African Americans, until the first half of the 20th century for women, until the second half of the 20th century uh, for men. So the overwhelming majority of the life of the American Republic, it was not by our 21st century standards uh, democratic. Um, the United Kingdom, the home of the mother of parliaments, had highly restrictive property qual qualifications for male suffrage. Women could not vote until 1832. They were only slightly uh, uh, liberalized in 1867, and they were no more enlightened about female suffrage than the Americans. The British women only got the vote after World War I. Women got the, vote to Fran in, got the right to vote in France in 1945. Half of French citizens were disenfranchised for the first 160 years of the French Republic, uh, French republics. Um, from the scornful way in which uh, observers in the West uh, describe gender restrictions in the Middle East, whether on suffrage or in terms of other rights, you would think that fully half the founding fathers of the American Republic in the 18th century were founding mothers, but they weren't. They were all men. Or you would think that women today uh, have half the jobs in American tenured, tenured uh, positions in American universities. They don't. They have less than a third. Uh, or uh, that the CEOs of major co corporations were half women, half men. In other words, uh, there's a great deal uh, there uh, that is not as, as, uh, as ideal uh, as people sometimes assume. Let me quickly say a couple of words about why there's so much misunderstanding about past efforts to establish constitutions in the Middle East before I move to the main historical focus of my talk. I should begin by saying that there's no question that the peoples of the Middle East have in, for the recent several decades, been forced to live under some of the ugliest authoritarian regimes around outside the former Soviet bloc. These included straightforward military dictatorships or one-party dictatorships in Syria or Iraq. Uh, these included absolute, or Algeria or Libya. Uh, these included uh, absolute monarchies like Saudi Arabia where nobody has any vote, any, any right. There actually is no citizenship. There's subjecthood and nationality. Um, they include more complex and hybrid systems that have evolved and have developed important aspects of democracy, Turkey obviously, uh, but other countries, uh, Iran, where you have this peculiar system of vilayet al-faqih combined with a republic, a guardian council combined with a majlis, with a parliament. Um, and there are many other hybrid examples, uh, some of them partially democratic, uh, a few of them like Lebanon actually democratic, but as corrupt as any democratic system can be. Uh, common failure of democracies. Then, in the Middle East, just to conclude, there's the anomalous case of Israel, which is, of course, a democracy for its own citizens, although 20% of them are grossly discriminated against. But for two-thirds of its existence, for 46 of its 65 years, has ruled through military occupation over millions of Palestinians who have been completely deprived of all basic rights. So it's a democracy, except for the people it's ruled over for two and a half generations in the occupied territories. It's perhaps this pervasive recent history of grimly repressive regimes in most Middle Eastern country, uh, plus the fact that people don't understand how these other systems work, that contributes to the widespread assumption on the part of Americans and Westerners that this region has never had any experience with democracy. But there are two other reasons uh, that are, uh, contribute to this impression. Uh, the first is that there has been a lengthy tradition of strong absolutist states in the Middle East. This was the region where civilization began. This is the region where urban life first began. Uh, this is the place where strong states first appeared uh, five or six uh, millennia ago. My daughter is an archaeologist, and they continually are pushing these, the frontier backwards in time uh, for the development of city-states that really had the attributes of states. 
Um, that tradition endured from several thousand years BC through the Islamic period, uh, with the most recent example being one of the most powerful and complex of early modern states, the Ottoman Empire, which ruled over most of the Middle East and the Balkans, as we all know, for many centuries until early in the 20th century. So that's one reason for this impression. This region has been the home to powerful, a, a powerful tradition of authoritarian states for longer than most other parts of the world have had civilization and states. Uh, uh, so this is, the, this is the home of authoritarianism in a certain sense, the Middle East. Another reason for the misimpression that people outside the region have is that there is an illiberal strand uh, in uh, Islamic political movements that has surfaced recently although I think its actual valence and its actual importance have been misunderstood. Uh, this has unfortunately led many to argue that this peculiar, particular, specific manifestation of radical political Islam represented the religion as a whole and for all time. I mean, this is a mindless assertion. It would be as foolish as to say that the Inquisition or Torquemada represented the entire spirit of Catholicism throughout history. Nonsense. Uh, uh, I'm going to come back to this point. So these are the preliminary observations that I want to make. Uh, now what can we say about the historical experience of the Middle East with democracy? And I, again, I want to make three uh, main points. Uh, the first is that in the latter half of the 19th century, the first half of the 20th century, the bulk of the Turkish and Arab elites and a large part of the elites of Iran were deeply affected by European liberalism for good and for ill. Um, this constituted what my, my own teacher, Albert Hirani, called a liberal age. Uh, there were, of course, powerful illiberal tendencies as well during this period of maybe 150 years. Uh, some historians have argued that these liberal ideas affected only a tiny literate stratum, that they had little or no effect on the broader population, and that they had limited effect on governance. Uh, I think this argument fundamentally misreads basic trends of social, intellectual, and cultural history in, in the Middle East. Uh, two indices of how widespread, uh, sorry, two indices of how misguided this denigration of the impact of liberal, liberalism is are firstly the growth of education and secondly the spread of the press, two crucial components of what Benedict Anderson calls press capitalism. You can't have a certain kind of nationalism, you can't have certain kinds of liberalism without what Anderson calls press capitalism. Education, for example, some of you are historians in this room, you'll bear with me for a minute, but for the rest of you, might as well hear this. Education uh, expanded extraordinarily rapidly in the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century, and this affected the entire empire. It didn't just affect Turkey, it affected the Balkans, it affected the Arab countries. Um, the number of modern government secondary schools in provincial capitals in 11 years went from one to 51 uh, between 1883 and 1894, 50 times. 50-fold increase in secondary schools. Uh, the first government school in all of geographical Syria, today's Syria, today's Lebanon, today's Jordan, today's Israel, Palestine, was set up in, eight, in six, 1861. By 1885, there were 158 uh, government elementary schools just in the district of Jerusalem alone. In the Mutasarifiyah of Jerusalem, there were 158 schools where there was only one uh, 24 years ago, uh, 24 years previously. In the area of Palestine, within its British mandatory boundaries, uh, by 1925, there were 314 state schools just for the Arab population. Every single one of them had been set up during the Ottoman period. The British established no schools in the first uh, six or seven years of their rule over Palestine. Such educational development was highly uneven. Some regions and some districts benefited more than others. Men benefited more than women. Urban populations benefited more than rural ones, and so forth so forth. Uh, the results were far from universal literacy. In Palestine by the mid-40s, only 45% of school-age Arab children were in school. Nevertheless, when you compare such results after a century of expansion of schools in Egypt and Turkey and in Palestine and elsewhere, with the widespread illiteracy and lack of schooling at the beginning of the 19th century, it's clear uh, that there had been a century and a half of fundamental educational change. This meant that Ideas that previously would only have been restricted to a tiny, narrow elite in, say, 1800, uh, by 1910 uh, could reach very broad sectors of the population, or 1920 or 1930. The impact of expanding education and of growing literacy uh, was a crucial factor in the development of the press. 
Uh, I won't go through this, um, but uh, uh, I think a, a crucial role was played by newspapers and other print media in spreading liberal ideas. Uh, some people have argued that while we can read articles in the press and discern what the authors intended, we cannot assess the impact of the press on readers. Uh, I think that's false. I think careful examination of the politics of the late 19th and early 20th century shows that the impact of the press was extremely big, large. Um, we can see it in a number of concrete cases. Uh, later on, radio and television expanded the realm of, of the spread of ideas. All of this is a roundabout way of showing that the means for transmission of liberal ideas to wider and wider segments of the population existed, uh, and that they were not just uh, uh, restricted to a narrow, educated elite. So that's my first general point. My second point is that the impact of these liberal ideas on governance was great. Um, I, I think that the structures of the governments we all deal with throughout the Middle East were laid down in this period. They were fundamentally changed. And what we deal with today, if you deal with the Turkish bureaucracy, or my wife deals with the Egyptian bureaucracy, or I deal with the Lebanese bureaucracy, or the Palestinian bureaucracy, we are dealing with structures that are essentially created in this period that we're talking about. The first, uh, uh, in, in the first part of the 19th century to the, to the first half of the 20th. Uh, state structures in Egypt, in Iran, in the Ottoman Empire, in the first two thirds of the 19th century were without exception dominated by autocrats who were wary of any limitations on their powers. Uh, Mahmoud II here, uh, Mehmed Ali in Egypt, uh, the various shahs of the Qajar dynasty in Iran. Ironically, however, the changes that they were making in state administration and the expansion of education had the inexorable spread, uh, inexorable effect of spreading liberal and radical ideas that ultimately undermined their absolute rule. So by changing the structure of state, expanding education, expanding the role of the state, they helped to spread the ideas that made autocracy and absolute government much more, much more difficult. Uh, the most important of these ideas was the idea that the, liberal, that the arbitrary power of the ruler should be limited and that there should be consultation with the, government, with the governed and eventually the consent of the governed and that people had the right to participate in politics. Um, it's true. These ideas of the late 19th and early 20th century were elitist, but in the context of the politics of the day in the most advanced countries in the world, in Western Europe and the United States, such elitist thinking was unexceptionable. And it was well in advance of thinking in elite circles in countries like Russia or Spain or Portugal. Most of Eastern Europe had much more uh, difficulty uh, uh, than this in fighting autocracy and in putting forward ideas of limited government. Um, obviously, the way in which these ideas operated differed from place to place. Um, uh, there were striking episodes for their time and place, however, uh, particularly in, at the beginning in Egypt and Tunis. In both places, ideas of consultation, ideas about consul consultative bodies, ideas about limiting the power of the ruler were already beginning to devolve, uh, evolve in the 1860s and 70s. But something happened in Egypt and Tunis. The natural evolution of these process, processes was cut short uh, by British and French occupations in 1881 and 1882, respectively. More importantly, in the countries that retained their independence from direct foreign rule, in the Ottoman Empire and in Iran, written constitutions were very soon afterwards established here, 1876, as you know, Iran, 1906. Uh, for all uh, the grave problems that both of these constitutional regimes faced, the Ottoman Empire and Iran had constitutions before many of the countries of Europe, before Russia, before most of Eastern Europe, before much of Southern Europe. Um, at the time, at this time, these changes were uh, still uh, limited. The opposition of autocrats, whether the Dey of Tunis, whether the Khedive of Egypt, whether the Sultan here, whether the Shah in Persia, was invariably stubborn and determined. But the pressures on these rulers were inexorable, uh, in large part because of their opposition to limitations on their prerogatives, uh, and because they were very often supported by European powers. Uh, these rulers uh, guaranteed that the results were very mixed. This is something that nobody seems to want to talk about when they talk about constitutions in the Middle East. Who undermined constitutionalism in Egypt? It was the British. They were developing a constitutional process in 1882. The Khedive's powers had been severely limited 
by a, consul a, le uh, by, by a, by a consultative body. Uh, uh, he was forced to accept a prime minister and the British intervened. Same kind of thing was happening in Tunis. The same kind of thing then happened in Iran after the Constitutional Revolution. The role of European powers that were nominally constitutional in their aspirations, in their, in their ideals, was invariably anti-constitutional, anti-democratic, pro-autocracy in favor of the narrowest uh, 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 level uh, of, of, of freedoms uh, to the populations. Um, we, know, we know how this happened. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, autocracy itself uh, changed things. Uh, Sultan Abd Hamid took advantage of the war with Russia in 1878. He suspended the constitution after two years. Uh, and in, in Iran, in the early uh, uh, 1900s, the Shah, backed by the British and the Russians, uh, uh, eventually escaped the limitations imposed on him by the Iranian constitution. That did not stop this process, however. The pressure for constitutional limits on arbitrary executive power continued in spite of this resistance by Middle Eastern autocrats, in spite of the opposition of privileged sectors in these societies, and notwithstanding the lack of support from the Western democracies, not to speak of the despotic Russian government. Um, but this didn't dampen the desire among many sectors of the people uh, for a greater role in politics. Um, in some ways, the a constitutional period in the Ottoman Empire from 1908 to 1918 is a period in which this desire for a greater role of the public in politics found expression. Uh, but if you look at why this broke down, war, Madison's nursemaid of executive aggrandizement, is really one of the main reasons. This first CUP coup in 1913 is carried out in the middle of the Balkan Wars. The, the terrible distortion of the constitutional system during World War I is partly a function, again, of World War I. Um, and uh, as a result, as we all know, these constitutional forms atrophied in the late Ottoman uh, Empire. Um, but after World War I, uh, the heritage of these pre-World War I constitutional struggles, I think, informed and influenced the systems that were established in many, many Middle Eastern countries, even, even in Turkey as well. Uh, but in Egypt, for example, in, starting in 1922, there was a parliamentary system established. Same thing was done under French and British rule in Iraq, in Syria, and Lebanon. Uh, the Palestinians were not allowed to have anything, constitutional, democracy, election, representation. That was a different situation. The Jewish population, yes, the Arabs were disallowed uh, by the British, but that's another story. Um, these new constitutional systems faced two problems in the Arab countries. Uh, uh, Turkey was a different situation. Uh, on the one hand, there were entrenched forces of privilege that resisted popular sovereignty, forces that clustered around the monarchy in the Egyptian and the Syrian cases, Egyptian and the Iraqi cases, sorry. On the other hand, there were the colonial ambitions of the Western powers, the British and the French, and their constant intervention, political, economic, uh, uh, subversive, and where necessary, uh, military, in the politics of these countries. Uh, the uh, interwar period uh, marked the height of liberalism in some parts of the Middle East, but also the height of European colonial intervention in the politics of the region. And this demonstrated the weaknesses of a liberal order, uh, the weaknesses of a constitutional regime in opposing outside meddling, uh, and these limitations grew even greater with the stresses and strains of independence after World War II. Um, so in many ways, the liberal order failed. Uh, by the end uh, of the 50s, um, all over the Arab countries uh, and in Turkey, uh, you had uh, 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 military governments beginning, beginning or, or, the, or the role of the military growing, uh, Egypt 1952, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that th this failure, which I cannot fully treat here, um, uh, is a worthy subject of study. Uh, suffice it to say that it illustrates the truism that even the oldest and best established constitutional orders face unprecedented stress in times of war, and that war in invariably enhances the power of even a democratic uh, executive branch. These were weak systems. They couldn't face internal and external stress. Think about Britain, France, the United States, and World War I. Think of the powers that accrued to Lloyd George, Clemenceau, uh, and President Wilson. Think of Britain and the United States in World War II. Roosevelt had almost dictatorial powers over the economy. Churchill basically superseded parliament. I mean, here are the oldest, best established constitutional systems. In wartime, the executive becomes almost uh, all powerful. Um, uh, 
I, I've cited the uh, observation of Madison that war is the true nurse of executive aggrandizement. And I think that uh, if this is true of old and stable democratic systems, then it's easy to understand that the weak, embryonic constitutional systems uh, uh, also succumb to this kind of uh, stress uh, in times of war. Uh, the Ottoman case is clear. Uh, the case of the Arab countries with war in Palestine uh, is also clear. Uh, the war in Palestine triggered a coup in Syria in 1949, a coup in Egypt in, 1970, in 1952, a coup in Iraq in 1958. Every leader of every coup in Syria, the entirety of the Egyptian free officers, every one of the three colonels who carried out the Iraq coup were officers in Palestine in 1948. They were all involved in that war. The stresses of that conflict uh, uh, basically undermined the existing constitutional order. Um, all of this, as I've said, was uh, exaggerated because these are countries with tenuous independence that were subject to constant, extensive great power uh, intervention. And if we can say one thing about the experience of the Middle East with, extension, with external intervention, uh, it is uh, that this external intervention rarely had liberal or constitutional or democratic outcomes. When I'm asked, uh, what did the United States do from the time it became a Middle East power in 1945 to encourage democracy, it's really very hard to find one instance where the, the, the support of constitutional systems and the, and the enhancement of democracy uh, was the primary or even a major objective uh, of US Middle East policy. And it was even less uh, the objective of British or French or, of course, Soviet policy. Um, now, I, I could talk about some of the positive uh, uh, results of, of the interaction between the Middle East and the West. These were not entirely negative interactions. I'm going to skip that section of my talk. Um, but I think that it's true uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, the interference of the great powers, leaving aside the positive impacts of whatever interaction there was between the Middle East and the West, the interference of the great powers, Western and, this, for that matter, the Soviet Union, for strategic or economic advantage since World War I, uh, and their alliance with I indigenous power structures uh, in defense of their interests, their imposition of foreign military bases, their armed interventions in the region, all of these almost always had the effect of stifling or undermining uh, liberal reform. Um, we can understand why that's the case. Uh, foreign powers, the last thing foreign powers wanted in the Middle East was regimes that represented popular sovereignty because that would limit the economic and strategic benefits that they drew from relations with weak, illiberal, unpopular regimes. Think of the Arab Gulf regimes. Think of countries like Saudi Arabia, which have absolutely no representative institutions. They're run by the senior princes of a single family. How much easier is it to influence Abdul Aziz or his sons than it would be to influence a parliament, than it would be to influence political parties? I mean, you can do it, but it's a much harder process. There are also regimes that have no legitimacy domestically. A, a, an established democracy has processes it has to follow. Uh, think of the difficulty of getting Saudi approval for uh, basing American troops in Saudi Arabia in 1990-91 after Saddam invaded Kuwait, and the difficulty of getting the Turkish government to accept uh, American troops uh, going into Iraq in 2003. Saudi Arabia, under a very limited amount of pressure, said yes, something that was rejected by most Saudis, but the government said yes. The Turkish government, whatever it wanted to do, had to give it to parliament, and Turkey said no. So the difference between a, a, a narrowly based monarchy in terms of how advantageous it is to deal with them for a power like the United States and any country with a democratic system is obvious. Every time Arab countries negotiate with Israel, the Israeli negotiators say, well, in any case, this has to be passed by our parliament. I mean, whatever we say has to be. Uh, accepted by public opinion and parliament. Whereas you take a Sadat and you just bully him until he says yes or says no. You have one ruler, an autocrat, who doesn't depend on his people for anything, who has no obligation to submit his decisions to popular, uh, 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 to any kind of popular forum, and who has no particular legitimacy. Uh, and you can see uh, the differences uh, in these cases. Um, I think all of these decades of experience, really going back to the 19th century, are relevant when we consider what the Bush administration said about fostering democracy, or when we consider the Obama administration's reaction to the Arab Spring. It reminds me of the words spoken by uh, Jack Nicholson 
uh, at the end of a film, A Few Good Men, he argues in a voice I can't possibly imitate, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Well, the Americans say they want democracy. I don't think they can actually handle uh, democracy in some of these circumstances um, if they really were faced with democratic outcomes. So this brings me to my third and final point, which has to do with the role of Islam in the processes I've just described. Um, scholars have written about the Islamic roots of some of the key elements in the reform of the state apparatus and in the legal system and in mechanisms of governance in the Ottoman Empire uh, during the Tanzimat period and the Hamidian period and the constitutional period. Um, Islam remained an essential element legitimizing uh, political power in the Ottoman Empire, in Iran, in Egypt. It remained an important source of popular understanding of politics in the region well into the 20th century. So Islam had a certain role. I think it's nevertheless the case that throughout this period, uh, there had appeared what I call an Islamic modernist synthesis, which stipulated that most aspects of law, traditionally a sphere uh, governed by Sharia, by the religious establishment, and most aspects of politics and governance, while they should be influenced by Islam, ought to be essentially secular. This was a, a, a synthesis that Islamic thinkers came to. Um, the separation between religion and state, as you all know better than I do, uh, was most extreme in the case of Republican Turkey. But it had begun to develop long before that, through the Tanzimat, through the Hamidian period, through the constitutional period in the Ottoman Empire, and the same general approach obtained thereafter in many aspects of the politics of other countries of the Middle East, including Iran and most of the Arab countries. I would say that for the last third of the 19th century, the first two-thirds of the 20th century, this largely secular approach grounded in this Islamist modernist synthesis dominated the politics of the region with a few exceptions. Um, even though uh, uh, liberalism, I think, collapsed in the Middle East in the middle of the 20th century, uh, the idea that politics should be secular uh, continued. Uh, but these exceptions are important, and I want to talk about three of them, and that's how I want to conclude my talk, about talking about the exceptions to the idea that politics should be secular. I think that they're important because out of these uh, exceptions grew the most important influences on political Islam in the last couple of decades. The first, and it's anomalous, but I want to talk about it, of these three exceptions to this secular paradigm, the first of these exceptions was the growth of Islamist political formations in Iran. Uh, and this was a function of the large role played by the Shia religious establishment in Iran from the 19th century right up to the present. Uh, in this respect, I would argue Iran was a partial anomaly in the Middle East as a whole. Iran is the country where this so-called Islamist modernist synthesis probably had the least purchase, the least influence. Uh, certainly, uh, political Islam has had a certain importance on the politics of other Middle Eastern countries. I could, I could list a couple places where, they, where it was important. But by and large, uh, with the exception of Iran, secular nationalist politics were dominant in most other Middle Eastern countries. You had parties like the Weft in Egypt. You had parties like the Kutla Wataniya in Syria. You had the neo Destur in Tunisia. In Iran, by contrast, secular nationalism and political Islam were always intermeshed. Secular politics were not dominant. Uh, religion was always there um, in an uneasy rivalry from the 1880s, 1890s until uh, the Iranian Revolution when Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini wielded together a political force, force that led to the triumph of the clerics under the banner of his radical and completely unprecedented doctrine of Vilayat al faqih The Iranian Islamic Republic represents a challenge to the Islamic modernist synthesis, and it represents a challenge to any secular politics in the Middle East and the Islamic world. So that's the first really important exception. The second exception to this rule about secularism in the region was the Muslim Brotherhood, Ikhwan al-Muslimin, which is, as we know, was founded in Egypt in 1928. Uh, initially, the Brotherhood was just one of many small political parties and movements uh, at the time that was founded and into the 30s, it was dwarfed by the secular nationalist Waft party. It was, in fact, it was probably smaller than several other parties. Uh, Musul Fatat, Young Egypt, uh, the communists, perhaps, were, per, were bigger uh, than the Ikhwan. But the Brotherhood eventually came to be one of the two main opposition forces under the 
regime of Gamal Abdel Nasser that was brought to power by the 1952 coup, the communists were the other leading opposition force. Uh, but after Abdel Nasser died, Anwar al-Sadat exploited the brotherhood to help him crush his opposition on the left, to crush the communists, to crush the Nasserists. And the brotherhood became and has continued to be a force to be reckoned with in Egyptian politics. Uh, as we know, there are other branches of the Brotherhood in Gaza, Hamas, in Egypt, uh, sorry, in, in Iraq, in Syria. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are sister parties um, that have had success in elections or that are powerful in different ways. Um, important, and I, I would argue this is an important exception to this uh, politics of secularism that was dominant uh, uh, previously. Um, important as the Brotherhood itself were its radical offshoots groups that took inspiration from Sayyid Qutb in the 1960s, a radical Islamist thinker in Egypt, and which combined with offshoots of other uh, exceptional, uh, uh, of, of the other exceptional fa uh, factors I'm talking about, uh, notably the Wahhabi branch of Islam, uh, which is the third one I want to talk about. Together, these have created a lethal new form of Islamist politics. So out of the exceptions, uh, have grown radical offshoots which have combined. And let me talk about the third of these exceptions uh, before I talk about that combination. The Wahhabis don't call themselves Wahhabis. That's what people who don't like them call them. The Wahhabis call themselves Muahidun uh, from the principle of Tawheed. They're there to bring our attention back to the unity of God, uh, the uniqueness of God. They're there to tell us that we're not supposed to worship shrines or holy men or saints or the family of the Prophet Ali. Uh, Hussein and so forth. Uh, they're therefore anti-Shia, uh, they're anti-Sufi. Uh, we know about the Wahhabis. Uh, they were originally a tiny local manifestation of Islam developing in the 18th century in the arid desert region of Nejd in the Eastern Arabian <coughs> Peninsula. They were a minor religious force. They have since become a global manifestation thanks to three factors. I notice I'm talking about everything in threes today. Um, the first was this Wahhabi movement's alliance with the Saudi dynasty, a fateful combination. The second was the petrodollars, which since the oil shock of the early 70s were lavished on Wahhabi preachers by the Saudi regime. And the third, the one nobody wants to talk about, is the support and encouragement uh, that Wahhabi ideology received for many decades uh, from the United States in particular, uh, as American policymakers saw the Wahhabi Islam as a counterweight to nationalism, to socialism, to communism, to the various forces uh, that were powerful in the Middle East, liberation ideologies, the Palestinian resistance movement, uh, Wahhabi Islam as an ideology as wielded first by King Faisal in the 60s was seen as a sword against this leftist radical sword. Um, if you look at how the Wahhabis were perceived in the 18th and 19th century, they were basically thought of as wild, deviant, wild-eyed, near heretics. They were as far outside the mainstream as they could possibly have been. They were very poorly regarded by the vast majority of ulama throughout the Muslim world. Um, but thanks to these factors I've talked about, uh, the alliance with the Saudi dynasty, the petrodollars, especially the petrodollars, and the, the fact that they were used as a tool in the Cold War by American policymakers. Uh, Wahhabi clerics today have developed the power to affect profoundly the determination of what is considered orthodox in the Sunni Islamic world. I mean, they have gone from being deviants, outsiders, near heretics, to being orthodox. In fact, their claim is they are the only really true orthodox, pious Sunnis. Everyone, everyone else is somehow uh, less, less than that. Now, all of these things I've talked about, the Iranian Revolution, the uh, uh, development of the Muslim Brotherhood, and especially radical offshoots from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, uh, from the thinking of Sayyid Qutb in the 60s, uh, produced to combine what I call a witch's brew, uh, combining uh, uh, people who had left the Brotherhood because it was too moderate, combining people who criticized the Wahhabis for not being Wahhabi enough, combine combining with other fundamentalist Salafi strains rooted in South Asian Islam, uh, uh, something that was already there in northern India and in what later became Pakistan. This brew was concocted in Afghanistan uh, as a result of the war 
against the Soviet occupation. Uh, it was concocted partly independently by these people coming together, meeting each other, exchanging ideas, being influenced by one another, some from Egypt, some from Saudi Arabia, some uh, from uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, but it took place under the aegis of three intelligence services, the American, the Saudi, and the Pakistani. They used these forces as tools in the war against the Soviet Union during its occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, at one stage, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was asked, well, you, the United States policy has helped to create al-Qaeda and uh, other extreme radical terrorist manifestations. He said, what's more important as a world historical phenomenon, defeating the Soviet Union or a few aroused Muslims? So there was a consciousness that this was, a, that this was what they were doing, and uh, clearly they didn't seem to care, at least Brzezinski, according to this interview, didn't seem to care about the consequences. This concoction, which brewed and became more intense in the cauldron of the Afghan war, produced a politics that was far from the liberal, constitutional, and democratic trends that I've been talking about. Uh, reflecting that time and that place, that war, uh, reflecting the circumstances of its genesis, reflecting the most extreme strands in Brotherhood thought, Wahhabi thought, uh, North Indian thought, um, North Indian Muslim thought. Uh, this politics was brutish, it was intolerant, it was a politics of violence, it was a politics of terrorism, it was fundamentally anti-democratic, and it was linked to a complete uh, perverse reading of Islamic history, Islamic political theory, and Islamic uh, uh, practice. Uh, rooted in the anti-liberal doctrines of the most extreme ideologues who emerged from uh, both the Muslim Brotherhood and the Wahhabis, and, and uh, this uh, Deobandi, North Indian synthesis. Um, one of the most striking characteristics of this witch's brew reading of Islam, this, this particular uh, uh, deviant, in my view, uh, reading of Islam, is that people who espouse it claim to be the bearers of the only true interpretation of Islam. Uh, uh, as Sayyid Qutb put it, um, you have the right to, of, of takfir, of calling other people who are Muslims kuffar, kafirs, if they don't agree with everything you say. And this was a, 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 not unknown in Islamic political theory, but this was new. Uh, and this was combined with guns, and experience in blowing people up, in, in assassination, in terrorism, uh, in this ruthless war that was waged against the Soviet occupation uh, of Afghanistan. Um, so they claim to be the bearers of the only true interpretation of Islam. Uh, they also claim to represent a continuity with Islam's genuine traditions, and they claim that every other interpretation of uh, this religion represents a dangerous deviation. Now, we know that many Muslims don't agree with them. In fact, most Muslims don't agree with them. But these claims that they are really the only true Muslims have been accepted at face value by many non-Muslim pseudo-experts. So we have the peculiar situation where not only do these different protagonists claim to be the only true Muslims, that they have the only true Islamic faith, but their claims are echoed by outsiders whose knowledge of Islamic history and of Islamic society is negligible. Um, you get a, there's, a, there's a cottage industry in the United States of people who are supposedly experts who write about this. They know nothing. They know absolutely nothing. They don't know, they don't know Islamic languages. They don't know Arabic, Turkish, Persian. They know nothing. Uh, but they pontificate about these things endlessly. Um, so what we have is a situation where the most perverse outliers, like the various branches of Al-Qaeda in different parts of the Islamic world are taken as representative of the entirety of Islamic societies that comprise over a billion people, uh, over half of the world. Uh, and the entire history of diversity within Islam is completely ignored in favor of a cartoon vision uh, based on the self-representation of this narrow, bigoted fraction of Muslims. Um, the irony of this is that even as these ultra-radicals, these jihadis, were moving towards a politics of violence and extremism and terrorism, uh, most mainstream Islamists, mo most people who rejected the secular synthesis, including the Brotherhood in Egypt, including many, many political uh, forces in Turkey and in other parts of the Middle East, um, including Hamas in Palestine, uh, many others, 
uh, moved towards an acceptance of constitutionalism, of democracy, of the rule of law in face of the unyielding nature of authoritarian regimes that dominate much of the Middle East. I, I, I leave to you uh, the extent to which uh, the, the, your governing party, the AKP, uh, has embraced all of this. Uh, but uh, I, I defer to you on that. But I, I think it, it, it's fair to say that whatever uh, affi 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 affinities uh, a group like the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt may have with some of its more radical Salafi offshoots, these are really two different things. And, and the, what the Egyptian regime says today about the fact that these are exactly the same is really a, a distortion of reality. Uh, there was a fundamental shift on the part of most people in the Muslim Brotherhood uh, towards accepting uh, some form of constitutionalism and democracy. What they understood by constitutionalism and democracy clearly uh, was insufficient. Uh, the, the failure of the Morsi regime is largely a result of how badly they interpreted constitutionalism and democracy. But that they shifted towards it, I think there, there can be no question. What will happen now is another issue. Irony of ironies, the rise of these uh, both mainstream movements that accepted democracy and their radical anti-democratic terrorist offshoots has obscured the fact that over the preceding century and a half, a, a liberal modernist Islamist synthesis emerged from the early 19th century through the middle half or even the second half of the 20th century. Today, it's almost as if nobody remembers that such a thing existed. Uh, similarly, the emergence of horrible authoritarian regimes uh, in the Arab world has obscured uh, the liberal and largely secular form of politics that the modernist synthesis in Islam helped to produce. Let me conclude. I've gone over a lot of territory. Um, constitutionalism and democracy and their roots in a growing educated population actually have had a rich history in the Middle East for over a century. It was a troubled history, but it was a rich history. Uh, people who are in favor of constitutions have had to contend with autocrats, and the autocratic tendencies of politicians when they get into power. They've had to contend with uh, oligarchies and aristocracies that did not want to cede their power. They've had to contend with absolute monarchs who never want to concede any of their power. They've had to contend with one-party regimes, but they've also had to contend with war, unceasing war in the Middle East. Uh, they've had to contend with foreign intervention. And finally, most recently, they've had to contend with a rising trend of anti-democratic, radical jihadi uh, extremism uh, among a fringe. But when uh, the peoples of this region try to make their political systems more democratic, when they try to limit the power of the executive and create better constitutional forms, this is a consequence of an indigenous process of rejection of our own authoritarianisms in this region and of foreign control. It is not an import from outside. These are indigenous forms that I'm talking about. The Muslim Brotherhood is not a foreign form. Liberalism in Lebanon is not a foreign form. I could go on and on and on. Um, Lebanon is an interesting case. Lebanon for 70 years has been subject to extraordinarily intense pressures from the outside and painful differences within Lebanon about the definition of the Lebanese polity. What is Lebanon? Who are the Lebanese? How should the country be defined? Um, external intervention included long periods of occupation. Israel occupied parts of Lebanon from 1978 until 2000. Uh, there are Syrian troops occupying parts of Lebanon until after 2000. Nevertheless, um, Lebanon managed to, uh, has managed so far to maintain the forms at least of constitutionalism and democracy in spite of all these pressures. They're now arguing about whether they can hold presidential elections, whether it's constitutional, how they can form a government. It's, all a, it's a constitutional debate in the papers, page after page of constitutional debate every day. Kuwait, much less democratic, but nevertheless, with some features of a constitutional democracy, some, some, uh, has similar debates. Um, what is my point? Uh, I could argue similarly about other countries uh, in the region. Uh, I think that there are evidence that there are forces that struggle to maintain constitutions where they exist, to strengthen them in the face of autocracy uh, where, there are, where, where they uh, are threatened, um, and to advance the forces of democracy against a daunting array of forces all over the Middle East. Now, I don't claim that I can predict the future. I've talked about history mainly. The history I've reviewed doesn't mean that these or other efforts to bring about 
constitutionalism and democracy will succeed. If the past is any indication of how the present may develop into the future, it appears that indigenous and external forces that do not favor democracy, that are autocratic or otherwise inclined, are at least as formidable in the Middle East as they have been at many times in the past century and a half. Um, as in the past, there is the specter of war. As in the past, there is the specter of external intervention. There's a civil war raging in Syria. There's a civil war in Iraq that I don't think really ever stopped from the moment of the American invasion. Um, there is a civil war raging in Libya of sorts. Uh, so you have wars and civil wars. You have external intervention. Uh, you have the possibility of expansion of these wars or of further foreign invasion. All of these factors have the potential to negate and even reverse movement towards democracy. Nevertheless, I would argue that constitutionalists, people who want limitation of the power of the executive and some kind of popular voice in making policy in this region, uh, can and should draw on this region's own indigenous traditions of constitutionalism in confronting these internal and external forces. These are forces that constitute obstacles to the just development of a more, sorry, to the, to the free development of a more just and more representative political systems in the Middle East. And it, is, it, it, it behooves people in this region to, to lean on that tradition. It is a healthy and a strong tradition. Thank you very much. Can we give you some water in the meantime? Yes, I need some water. Okay. Thank you. There you go. So we have some time for Shall questions? Sit down or stand up? No, whatever you prefer. Stand up. Stand up. Just as okay. Thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening uh, speech. Thank and, you. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, comment, uh, I would like to have your comments on a NAFTA party in Tunisia, uh, whether you place them also in this uh, modernizing synthesis. <laughs> Thank you. I should have talked more about Tunisia because it's a good question. Thank you. Um, the question was about a NAFTA party. And uh, yes, a NAFTA fits squarely into this uh, tradition of. Um, both the modernist Islamist synthesis and of uh, an acceptance of, of democratic forms. And I, 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 I don't want to predict anything, but the news in the last few days is that uh, the Anahda party has agreed with other forces in Tunisia on a transitional process uh, and, and a, on, on the establishment of a new constitution. If they succeed, um, they will be the first of the revolutions in the Arab world that has actually moved from removing the regime to producing a stable constitutional system. But that's a big if. But yes, they fit at squarely within the tradition I talked about. Yes. Thank you. Wait, wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your enlightening talk. Um, you mentioned as you were talking that you were a historian by profession. So please excuse my uh, being, uh, my question is coming from a politics, a student of politics. Uh, where do you put question, issue, um, variables like um, in interests or um, institutions? I mean, uh, you, you underlined that it was, I mean, war conditions and uh, importance of war uh, and the importance of these indigenous uh, groups, but you know, Perhaps uh, institutions like the strength of the armies or people's economic interests uh, uh, are also factors that can prevent constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. So what do you say, what's, mm -hmm. your, what's your stance on this political yes. science explanation of things at large? I should yeah, perhaps... I, I, I should say that I mean, I'm, I'm a historian, but some of my best friends are political scientists. I have nothing against political scientists or, or sociologists or others. They're wonderful people. Um, except maybe you, Fred. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I actually alluded to the power of oligarchies and entrenched economic interests in my talk. Um, they have been and 
will continue to be one of the strongest forces operating uh, against what I'm particularly talking about, which is constitutionalism, which is limitations on the power of the executive. But remember, um, one of the problems of democracy, which any advanced democracy will illustrate, is the power of capital and of, of interests, if you want to call them that, um, to dominate the political system. I mean, the role of money in the American political system is, I think, very revela revelatory of the degree to which extraordinarily powerful interests can create political movements. The Tea Party, which is, dominates the Republican Party in the South, our American Republican Party, not um, is it largely the creation of a few billionaires. I mean, literally, a few very, very rich men, the Koch brothers and a few of their partners, have created a movement that's helped to take over one of the major political parties in the United States. Now, that's democracy. It's fundamentally corrupt. It's fundamentally open to manipulation by interests. Um, and it's constitutional. I mean, you have a Supreme Court which has ruled that um, corporations are people and that free speech includes the right of people to spend as much money as they want. That is speech. Spending dollars is speech. It's a peculiar American interpretation, but it's constitutional. So this is the stage beyond getting a constitution and establish a democratic system, which is to make that democratic system uh, free of these kinds of enormously powerful interests. So that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question is actually, we, we haven't even gotten to that to a certain extent in most Middle Eastern countries. You deal with it here because you have a functioning democratic system. But most parts of the Middle East, they're not, they're not there. You can see in Lebanon, you can see in Turkey, the corrupting power, or the corrupting influence of these powerful interests. In Lebanon, it's sometimes families. In Lebanon, it's, it's different than Turkey, but there's an analogy. Uh, in other Middle Eastern countries and in Turkey, you have enormously powerful institutions within the state and most importantly, the army. You can see this in Egypt. I mean, the, the power of the military in Egypt, you've seen it in Turkey. We know it in Turkey. We know it from the late Hamidian period, especially the constitutional period, and we've seen it in the Republic from the beginning to the end. Um, but it is equally a, a, the case in systems that have not really been democratic since, the, in the case of Egypt, since the 1950s. From the moment the military take, took over, the role of the military, the size of the military, the economic power of the military has grown and grown and grown. So when you talk about limiting absolute power, you're not talking about an autocrat or a monarch. You're talking about limiting the absolute power of this enormous part of the state. Um, and that really is part of it. And how you limit that, I, 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 this is a huge, huge issue uh, uh, in, in countries like Egypt. And in, 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 in Algeria, in any country where the military has seized power, in Yemen, uh, the, the, the Tunisians are immune because their, their army is tiny and has never been involved in politics. Um, but most, most Middle Eastern countries that have fought wars have huge armies, like Turkey, like, uh, like Egypt and Syria, Iraq, and so on. So I would like you also for a very interesting talk, and I, I think it's a little bit of a follow-up on uh, Professor Arad's question. So, you know, when I was listening to your talk, I was kind of under the impression that there is a, a fixed, stable, desirable goal, namely a constitutionalist and democratic society that, you know, some have attained, and we are sort of in the stages of maybe attaining it, but or some of the Middle Eastern countries are in the stages of attaining it. But I think in your answer, you also has, have, have sort of alluded to that there is a kind of the post-stage, Right. You know, where there is discontent, and this discontent is kind of like, you know, the United States feeling itself in a perpetual state of war. But, you know, if you're a little bit more cynical, part of this is, of course, driven by terrorism, but part of it is, is if you think about the NSA or so, is, or, you know, is that, you know, governments, the executive wants to always consolidate more power, and you have the Occupy movement. So there is a discontent with the target that the latecomers of the middle stage are kind of you know, trying to aspire to according right. to your talk, but there is a post that is already present. I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, when you talk to these Islamic terrorists, they can they have a list of all those things that go wrong with democracy as it as it pans out in the, you know, right. in the West, so to speak. So that must have this this must be fueling or affecting the dynamics that's happening in the Middle East. Mm. And I wonder whether you can talk a little bit about this. Well, I mean I think I think you're right in, in a very important uh, uh, point that I think you're making, which is that the failures, I, I go back to history, the failures of the liberal constitutional order in several Middle Eastern countries were, were disastrous for liberalism, disastrous for the idea of democracy, parliaments, constitutions. I mean, when the coup took place in Egypt, 
Uh, it took place against a, an order that was perceived by most Egyptians as absolutely rotten, incapable of solving the problems of society. You had an oligarchy that would not give up its power. Uh, you had a, a, a society that could not deal with any major difficulty. And then on top of it, you had the Palestine War. And the, the army had failed. Uh, so th these are orders that collapsed in the past. And I think that uh, the post-liberal era of autocracy and authoritarian regimes is critiqued in much the same way by the jihadis. They say, well, look at what we've had. We've had democracy. That's failed, liberalism. We've had, and now we've had generals and, 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 and one-party regimes, and that's failed. Um, now, the question is, what are they going to put in its place, and can they win popular support for that? And I don't see any evidence that they have any idea of what to put in place. And I don't think they have any chance of winning very large popular support. The, second, the first part of your question, however, I, 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 just to follow up on what I just said, is true. It's not like you reach some nirvana, which is called a stable constitution, and a democratic order, and you've solved your problems. That's when your problems begin. And those are problems of entrenched interests that manipulate democracy as they manipulate other systems. Um, so democracy doesn't solve problems of class. It doesn't prob solve problems of inequality. It doesn't solve problems of the concentration of capital. It solves none of these problems. It, it, it can be manipulated uh, by powerful interests. Uh, in fact, in some ways more easily than other, other systems. Um, but um, I think you would have to posit for me a different kind of system. Uh, than any of the ones that I've talked about, uh, for me to say that that's not the level you reach and then you really deal your, with your problems. I mean, limiting executive power and having more freedom for individuals and groups in society would seem to me to be an end that you know, most people seem to want. We don't want a deep state controlling everything. We don't want an NSA listening to us. We don't want, these are the things that are happening in the United States. I'm not talking about Turkey. I'm talking about the United States. Uh, we don't want uh, the intrusive uh, 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 feeling up of our persons every time we take an airplane. We don't want many things that have been imposed in the United States, extensions of executive authority. And any normal human being would resent those things. So that's why I talk about limitation of the power of the executive as an absolute good. It's not the, only, it's not the goal. Once you've done that, you still have the question of how do you control the executive? I mean, let's say you limit its power. How do you elect it or choose it? And there, as I said, Chicago gives you a perfect example. It's, a, it's an easily corruptible process, democracy. And if you don't deal with issues of class and you don't deal with issues of, of inequality of, of income distribution, then inevitably you're going to have what happens in the United States and what in some respects happens in every democracy, which is you know, concentrated power of capital will dominate the media, will dominate political parties, and then, then where are you going to get you know, the, the, the benefits that society wants? So democracy is just a precondition for other things which are not going to be achieved because you have a constitution. By no means does that solve the problem. That's just the first stage after which your real problems begin. I realize that the sheer breadth and scope of uh, your presentation would uh, almost inevitably make it prone to generalization. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to make a point particularly uh, regarding one of the exceptions that you mentioned, and mm -hmm. it is uh, the Iranian history. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid from my point of view, there is a serious misreading of Iranian history in this respect, and the relationship between religious and secular forces were not the way that you made it out to be. Actually, in Iran in, in uh, the 20th century, if anything, uh, the political Islam was uh, up to 1970s, 60s, mid 70s, was very weak. Mm -hmm. I agree that popular Islam was strong, but political Islam was not really strong. It was only in the course of the revolution we heard that the slogan of Islamic Republic. There had never been such a writing. Mm -hmm. and, the intellectual discourse on Islam in Iran up to 1960s, mid-60s and 70s, early 70s, was very weak. And in fact, the nationalist movement in Iran, secular nationalism, was uh, fairly powerful. I only recall here uh, Mossadegh and the mm -hmm. nationalization of oil, which came three, four years before anything mm -hmm. happened in Egypt. Mm -hmm. You see, 
And uh, if the first crack was in the, if you like, uh, the bastion of the empire, it came from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the important point that I would like to draw your attention is that Islam, Iranian secular nationalism really fell victim to the Cold War. It was the Cold War that uh, made an alliance between monarchy and the religious forces. It was the fear of Iran going red, fear of Iran being dominated by Soviet Union mm -hmm. ever since 1920s mm -hmm. in Iran. And there were movements to suggest that the left-wing forces underneath were quite strong. Mm -hmm. And this also, I mean, if we count those forces as secular forces, therefore I think the kind of generalization that you present from the exception, if anything, I think Iranian religious forces even been more open to modernism than they have been actually in Egypt. Mm -hmm. I can give you various examples. We never had anybody like Sayyid Qut before. Mm -hmm. This is the situation, I think. But I realize that when, this, when the scope of talk is such, even for a historian, would lead to generalizations mm -hmm. such as this. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I would defer. You, you may have a much deeper understanding of Iranian history than I do, but I, uh, and I would defer to you on that. But I would still insist that you may not want to call it political Islam, but I mean, look at the role of the clerics in the tobacco protests. Look at the role of the clerics in the 1905 revolution. Look at the way in which the role of religion in the 1906 constitution is preserved. Look at the cleric, role of the clerics. It's, admittedly, you can talk about the way in which the imperial powers played on this situation, used the Shah, used religion. But look at the role of the clerics in all of the unrest right up to the World War I. Um, uh, in many cases, I think, helping to, to make the constitutional experiment fail. Uh, then again, look at the clerics in the, in, the, in the 1953 coup. Yes, of course, they were allied with British and American intelligence and overthrowing a constitutional regime. Um, but I think that you do not see any parallel to that in the politics of any other Middle Eastern country, frankly. I don't see organized religion and political, what I, I, maybe, maybe the, the term is wrong, political Islam, playing anything like a role in the 1890s or the 19, early 1900s or the 1940s uh, that, uh, or 50s, uh, early 50s, uh, that the clerics played in, in Iran. Now, I, I, so I would, I would respectfully disagree with you. I mean, I, I think that you actually do have less influence of organized religion in Turkey, in Egypt, in most Arab countries in that period, late 19th, first half of 20th century, than you have in Iran, which is a distinction. And I think it has maybe to do with the differences between Sunni and Shia Islam. I don't know, but there seems to be there. The second point, I agree with you, as far as the role of the Cold War. The Cold War helped to destroy secular politics. It helped to destroy liberalism, helped to destroy constitutionalism, helped to destroy democracy in many countries. Because uh, what they wanted were, I mean, what they wanted were authoritarian regimes that would do what they wanted. The Shah was, the, in fact, the best example. Uh, and I agree with you. But um, they also mobilized and energized political Islam by allying with conservative, in some cases, reactionary political forces like Wahhabism. So uh, in that case, in that sense, in that, for that part of the question, I fully agree with you. It was not just destructive in Iran. Uh, it was destructive elsewhere, all over the region. I think the Cold War played a terrible role in terms of uh, parliamentary democracy, constitutionalism, liberalism, sec and especially secular, uh, secular forces. Thank you. Well, Rashid, you know, what a pleasure to see you here and hope to see you more often on this eastern shores of Europe. Uh, that's one. That's very pleasant. I really pleasure. But I want to be critical. I want to be a bit of challenge you, mm -hmm. if I may. I think I, sort of. I wouldn't should, express less. Well, I wouldn't I mean, expect we should, less. We should enjoy ourselves. You know, <laughs> homilies is not the right place for an intellectual like you and these. Now, uh, here is my criticism. Uh, I think what is missing in your question of stability, democracy, and absence of it, is a is the a class analysis, but I don't mean Marxian sense, no. Uh, 
in the sense that Sheriff Mardin had done with the Young Turks. Mm -hmm. The conflict between traditional elites and the new lower middle class, the officer class that is not, as it is in Latin America at least, although I don't know that much about Middle East, but does not represent recruit from traditional elites, maybe the exception of Egypt. Mm -hmm. My point is to repeat, once we miss that, once we miss that component of conflict with, between a new upcoming aspiring elite and the existing tradition elites, the system creates instabilities which makes constitutionalism and liberalism much more difficult. Let me continue. In a way, I think we are, you are discovering sort of Ranimate Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. The whole thing about Magna Carta, not in the mythologized sense, but historical sense, is a legitimate elite, which the barons were, challenging an executive. Mm -hmm. Not the people, not the, the, you know, the thing that we hear, but it's really traditional elites challenging. Now, I think liberalism is a regime in the Middle East, and Lebanon is a wonderful example, is it is the power of the traditional elites to establish part of elite collegiality and within that, be able to establish sort of more liberal, quote unquote, politically defined democratic stability. Mm -hmm. And the absence of that, of traditional, legitimate, legitimate, legitimate traditional elites, the absence of that creates the avenue for authoritarians. Mm -hmm. Now, the big problem with the military rule, of course, is that it, it aspires and it thrives on eliminating the traditional elites. And that's the, that was the case in Iraq. I suppose it was the same in Syria. So the, really, the question of stability of liberal constitutional regime is the seesaw between these two classes in the larger sense is what I would like to suggest. Mm -hmm. And to conclude, and I want to come to Yeshim's question, but that's like a good Turk, of course, she doesn't pay any attention to traditional elites, and she thinks to put institutions in place. I do that too. But there's a very sort of a Republican Turkish instinct, which I admire, adore, and there. But, you know, but in, in, of course, in Lebanon, they have more stable democracy because they have the elites sit down and they negotiate and they have very well established informal institutions like the British. They all agree who is going to do what. And the last example, who is the one who gave a seat in the, in the cabinet, which party? The Jumblat gave a seat in the cabinet to allow, some, who allow somebody else to come in and sort of eliminate his Mullah influence to establish stability. Mm -hmm. Now that you can do only among elites, mm -hmm. to sit down and negotiate. So, point yeah. is that I think that I did not see in your analysis mm -hmm. that really liberal regime requires in the political democracy, not social democracy, political democracy requires legitimate elites solving problems. And that of course contradicts the whole idea of democracy in the sociological sense, mm -hmm. the larger participation. And that becomes a dilemma, I think. The large participation, I mean, political and sociological concepts of democracy there rival each other to give us a handle to the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. Um, there's too much there to answer, uh, unless I want to tire the audience. But let me take one part of, of your very good question. It's not a question. You're very good critique. Um, yes, I, I didn't focus on elites or, or class in the talk. Um, and you could easily add a whole dimension to what I said, uh, which I think would enrich it a great deal. Um, in the Egyptian case. I, I, would, I would not like to generalize from Lebanon. Everything you said about Lebanon, by the way, is right. So I'm not disagreeing. But it's, a, it's a, quite a remarkable, exceptional, unique country. Uh, because of the Arab countries outside the Gulf, it's the only one that hasn't had any kind of social revolution of any sort besides you know, Jordan, Morocco, the monarchies, uh, and the Gulf. Um, some kind of social revolution is taking place in every other Arab country. Uh, some kind of replacement of traditional elites has taken place in every other Arab country. Algeria, where the old traditional elite was linked to the French. Tunisia, same thing, and so on. Egypt. 1952 was a new class of military officer who represented the first promotions out of the military academy of native Egyptians. Before 1936, only aristocrats 
Only people basically descended from Muhammad Ali or who are Pashas could send their sons to the military academy. In 36, the Waft changed that policy. The first group of graduates were the free officers. So they represented exactly what you're talking about. And you're right about Iraq and you're right about Syria. Same thing. And they, there was a level of elite transformation as a consequence of that. Um, I don't think, though, that if you go back to the Young Turks, and if you go back, or, or if you take these examples that I'm talking about, it necessarily fits with what you're saying about, about elites and, and, and democracy. I mean, you can fit a, you can fit a social transformation uh, 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 lens onto this and add a great deal of richness to it, but I don't think it necessarily gives you the, the, the defining or determining uh, a, a factor. It, it complicates the analysis. It makes it much more complete than my very, I, I, the talk was an hour. If I'd talked for an hour and a half, I could have, I could have added those things. Um, and I think that they explain a lot in some of these cases. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't take the Lebanese case as an example. It, it, it is, in a certain sense, the purest democracy, and it's the most corrupt system imaginable, and it is a system in which the oligarchy has not changed. It's remarkable. I mean, you go there and you find a name whose grandfather was in parliament 60, 70 years ago. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Jim Blatt is going back to the 1830s and 40s, but even some of the others who are Johnny come lately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I wouldn't generalize from Lebanon. Uh, it's, not a, it's not anything you can generalize with. But it, it, again, it's the only one of these countries, besides the monarchies, that has had absolutely no transformation of the elites. Absolutely none. Uh, and, and yet it doesn't have a monarchy. So it's an anomaly. Thank you for this talk. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, so I had this question about the concept of constitution uh, from a very basic point of view. So you focus on the point of or moment of limiting the government. Mm -hmm. um, limiting the executive. Back, right, or executive. But constitutions are also about constituting. Mm -hmm. the, com uh, the community, the society, and so on and so forth. And when I think about the limits to constitutional rule in the Middle East, I s immediately think about the um, lack, perhaps, of territorial sort of security or unity of nations. I mean, when you talk about Turkey, let's say, or you know, it's the, the, the territorial boundaries of these states have been in flux for quite a long time. And now we see like in the case of Syria, in the case of Iraq, the borders are being sort of like redrawn or will be redrawn in the future. So in a sense, the problem um, I see is not just about limiting like some strong man in the government, but the absence, so to speak, of a, um, of a sort of like right. a solidified, territorially cohesive, united, whatever you mm -hmm. call it, um, um, community or state or whatever. Right. So, um, A, I was wondering if you agree with this uh, point and how it would, uh, it would fit into your analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, but B, and to be on the more provocative side, um, in a sense, in the Western Front, constitutionalism came after absolute monarchies, right? Mm -hmm. Like territorial cohesion, and later on, constitutionalism came. Um, so, um, and I know this is provocative, but uh, perhaps the lack of constitutionalism in the Middle East is not due to the existence of some strong executive, um, strong guys like military or whatever, but because of their lack. Hmm. Because of a lack of strong guys who ended up, you know, like unifying their territories in such a way to give way to the emergence of constitutionalism in a secure way. Hmm. Um, and maybe one final question. I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm going to forget your first point. If you give me a third point, uh, I'm already losing the first one. <laughs> let's let's stop. Let's stop at those two. Um, well, I mean, it's interesting the the second point you make uh, about. Um, let me take the first one. Let me take the first one. I, I could have talked about constitutions in several dimensions. I focused on limitation of the power of the executive. You, you, you brought up another one, which is constituting. Uh, you, you talked mainly about constituting the state in terms of boundaries, but you can talk about constituting the state in terms of citizens. I mean, who are the citizens? Who is the people? What is the people? Um, or in other terms, for that matter, um, in terms of religion. Uh, uh, so it's not territory and it's not... 
we are people of this ethnicity, but we are of this religion. And in, in the Egyptian constitution, it's a big issue, uh, the position of Islam in the writing of the Egyptian constitution. Um, I didn't talk about that, and you're right. Um, I don't think that the fact that you correctly cited that many Middle Eastern states have what you might call fuzzy boundaries, uh, boundaries that are, may, may, may not be stable, uh, changes many of the things I was talking about insofar as limitation of the power of the executive. It, they do change the other aspects of what a constitution does, which is to define what the nation is, and which is to define the limits of the citizenship, the citizenry. Um, and there, uh, I'm not, again, th there are different kinds of Middle Eastern states. I mean, you have some Middle Eastern states like Morocco or Egypt or Oman, which have had stateness long before they were nation states. Oman was an empire, Morocco was an empire. There was always an Egypt. The, the, the frontiers of Egypt were always known. They were at this cataract on the Nile. They were at this place between Rafah and al Arish. You know, whether it was part of a larger empire, Egypt was always Egypt. Misr was always Misr. You know, so, so some of these places don't have these problems of defining boundaries to the same extent. Turkey is a, is a different case, obviously. And the countries of the Eastern Arab world are a different case. Uh, Syria, Lebanon, you have these long straight lines drawn by M Monsieur Picot and, Mr. And, and Sir Mark Sykes have nothing to do with the local conditions. It's entirely this power's interests and that power's interests that determine the northern borders of Saudi Arabia, the borders of Jordan, the borders of Iraq, the borders of, and so on and so forth. Um, and in those states, I think two things can be said. One is that, yes, they are countries with fuzzy boundaries and their very existence as nation states may be called into question. But that at the same time, the same problems are gonna, ex have existed and will continue to exist uh, in these states, uh, irrespective of how they end up. I mean, whether Iraq ends up a federal state or a non-federal state, whether Iraq breaks up, uh, is in some measure a constitutional question. And if it breaks up, then what will be the constitution of the Kurdish part? What will be the constitution of some of the other parts? Same thing with Syria. Um, but it's it, pointless to talk about this in a situation where these issues are in flux. We don't know what's going to happen in Iraq. We certainly don't know what's going to happen in Syria. But I think some of these questions continue. Now, the second part of your question about strong men um, or strong states, I, I'm not sure I agree with you really. Um, and, I mean, maybe it's provocative, but I, I think I just, I just don't think I necessarily agree with you. I think these are regions that have actually, this region has actually seen a lot of remarkably strong rulers in the 20, 19th and 20th centuries. I mean, Mehmet Ali, uh, Mehmet II in Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, um, Jamal Abdel Nasser, I, there are a number of them. I, I mean, for heaven's sakes, you have one of them right behind me. There's his bus. Uh, he's omnipresent. Um, so I'm not sure that was the lack or the thing that was missing. Uh, some places it was, some places it wasn't, perhaps. But um, I would lay much more stress on external intervention, frankly. I mean, if you look at countries like Egypt or Jordan or Iraq, and you look at the role that the British played, you basically can't talk about the creation of these countries in their modern form uh, without talking, and, uh, and certainly their constitutional forms, without talking about what the British did. And the same is true with Syria and Lebanon and Tunisia and Morocco and Algeria for the French. So, yeah, I mean, you may be right that, that, that there are some issues there, but I would, I would lay stress on other factors myself, especially external intervention. Okay, I think, uh, last one? one last one? Thanks for your enlightening speech, Mr. Khalidi. My question will be about the current situation of Islamic movements, particularly political, and its reflections on the region's future. On the one hand, we have the AKP experience in Turkey, the party which was for a long time presented as a role model for the region uh, and, and the Islamic world in general, with its, uh, its market-friendly, Western-friendly uh, reformist agenda, seemingly in compliance with democracy, secularism. What, what it turned out to be is an authoritarian regime. Uh, is an authoritarian regime. The co constitution is undermined. The freedom of expression, freedom of press is undermined. On the other hand, and the system is just one-man regime, uh, sort of one-man regime. And on the other hand, what we have is the violent crackdown of the elected Muslim Brotherhood uh, government in the 
Egypt, which, has, which carries the potential of radicalizing all the Islamic movements, all the Islamist movements in the region. And my question, considering all these, what would be the reflections on the future of the region? Thanks. On the? Uh, what would be reflections? Of all of this uh, on? Of all of these on the region's future. Oh, boy. So you basically want me to take a crystal ball and tell you what's going to happen. Well, I just said that the job description of a historian does not include predicting the future. I have no idea what's going to happen. I certainly don't have any idea what's going to happen in Turkey, um, especially after what happened today. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, but let me say something in response to your question anyway, even though I can't really answer it. Um, yes, it may be that what happened on the 30th of June and subsequent days in Cairo will uh, drive uh, some people who had accepted the idea of a democratic uh, transition uh, towards more radicalism, um, especially in Egypt. I'm not sure it'll have that effect throughout the region. Um, I think you can look at two immediately adjacent societies, Tunisia, or almost immediately, one country over, and Palestine. Look at the impact on al Nahda and Hamas of what happened in Egypt. It will have an effect in Egypt. What I'm suggesting is it may not have a huge effect elsewhere. Um, in both of these cases, uh, Hamas and al Nahda are clinging with great desperation to democratic forms uh, without great success in the Palestinian case because of various issues I could talk about. Um, so, yes, there is a minority of people who are going to say, well, this proves to you that the liberals and the secularists and the, 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 and the whatever they characterize them as will never allow us to gain power. We have to gain it through the gun, and it may drive some people to jihadi militants. That's what I, you're, I think you're suggesting. Yes, but I don't think that that's going to be a huge phenomenon because I don't think that that avenue has any kind of promise of a future for most people. I mean, to say we're going to create a caliphate, I, I find it hard to believe that's going to be a popular appeal. I frankly think that watching what's happening in Syria, where the guys who have guns and have that position uh, are powerful on the ground, but where public opinion has swung behind uh, a, an authoritarian regime that I think most Syrians really disliked quite heartily, because they've seen what uh, the extreme jihadis of the Islamic State in Iraq and Hashem and, uh, and Nusra and the other fellows are like in practice, uh, in governance. Um, they don't have, I think, a vision that most people will support. Now, I may be wrong. That's just, I'm not speaking now as a historian. I'm speaking as someone who reads the newspapers and talks to people coming from Syria. And a year ago, the people coming from Syria, most of them were, hated the regime. Today, they're more afraid of these people than they are of the regime. So I think that some people may be driven in that direction, but I don't think they're going to be a large, a huge number of people. I certainly don't think they're going to be a, minor, a majority. Uh, and I think that the way in which, uh, even in Egypt, the Brotherhood has behaved, uh, they haven't accepted the change that's taken place, uh, but they have not yet rejected uh, some kind of position for them in the system. They keep talking about sharia, legitimacy, meaning we want Morsi to be restored as president. Um, a few of them talk about the mistakes they made. Uh, not many of them. All of them, most of the rest of them see it as the military as being evil and so on and so forth. But I think that, I think that to suggest that that leads you away from uh, the acceptance by most of the Islamist political movements, at least in the Arab world, of some form of democratic politics is maybe an exaggeration. Now, what the impact of Turkey on all of this is, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Turkey had an enormous influence on some Islamist political formations, influence in terms of example, of a way in which you could supposedly uh, combine a secular system with a democratic system with Islam, uh, of a way in which you could control the military, of a way in which, and so on and so forth. I think that, that some of the, uh, the, the bloom is off the rose as far as that's concerned. I think people, if they look carefully at Turkish politics, uh, may not be as enchanted by things here as they once were. And I think that, Syria, that uh, Turkish policy in, in various areas uh, in the Arab world, which functioned very effectively for the first few years when it was mainly soft power, uh, uh, 
TV serials of you know Ottoman sultans and beautiful women and yadas on the Bosphorus, um, and 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 economic power, you know, investment, construction, and so on and so forth, uh, had an easy ride. But when uh, 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 policymakers here had to deal with the real problems of these countries as they erupted in the last three or four years. It, it looks a very different picture, a very different picture. And I don't think Turkey is viewed in anywhere near as positive a light in many parts of the Islamic, of the Arab world as it was five years ago. Uh, and I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, uh, the generals in Egypt or, you know, a few uh, characters here or there. I think that, uh, that uh, Turkey still has this soft power, uh, much underrated. It's still a very, very important asset. Um, but the idea of a Turkish model or the idea that Turkey actually can presume to lead and tell other people how to behave, I think that's finished. Uh, I don't think it has much of a future as an idea. And I think you really have now a problem with, you know, from, from a, a policy of no problems in any direction, of problems in every single direction which have to be dealt with. Um, serious problems in some cases. I mean, Syria is a problem for everybody. It's not just a problem for Turkey. It's a problem for, a pressing problem for Lebanon, pressing problem for Jordan. It's a problem for Iraq. It's a problem for everybody in the region. Um, and it's partly caused, I mean, it's caused by the many, many countries' policies, but one of them is Turkey. It helped to cause the situation. You know, can be held responsible for some aspect of the situation. So, um, I think that means that you're not going to have people looking at Turkey in quite the same way. Uh, you, could, you could talk about other issues where there've been, there's been a little more success. I mean, dealing with Iran recently, there's been a little more success, I think. And it's a much wiser policy than the policy that Saudi Arabia is following of confrontation with Iran. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a foolish policy for a country that's much weaker than Iran. Uh, Turkey has the advantage of being a very powerful country. It can deal on a basis of equality with a country like Iran. But there, for a while, there was a, a ignoring uh, of some basic realities, like you share a frontier, and like this is, trade between the two countries is really important, and their energy is important to Turkey, and so on. Um, and fortunately, I think there's been a recognition of some of these factors. Um, but now, internal affairs seem to take everybody's minds off of these foreign policy issues. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you very thank much. You. And thank you for